thank you for coming. Um, so uh, we've probably got at least 60 minutes of, of information and content to share. It could stretch longer if we get a bunch of questions. But I, I do want to thank you all for coming. Um, this is the first uh, time that we've attempted something like this. Um, and the intent was to help uh, families and skaters and players uh, to get a better understanding of the college recruiting process. Uh, it can be a complex endeavor, uh, and we thought that if we brought some people with some experience and knowledge together, um, we could really share some really good information. So that's what we really hope to do this evening with everyone. Um, before we get started, I'll do a couple introductions and some thanks first. First is to thank the Nichols School, and especially Jamie Prince and Rob Stewart for hosting us tonight. Uh, they were very gracious to have us. As most of you know, um, Bison Hockey and the Nickel School have had a long-term, many-decade relationship and partnership, and it's been great for both of us. Um, so it's really nice for Nichols to offer to host us tonight. So thanks to Jamie especially and Rob as well. Um, and I just want to do a quick thanks and just a brief introduction before we get into our panel this evening. So uh, Chris Baudo. Uh, Chris, maybe raise your hand. Yep. So Chris is with us tonight. Chris is the head coach of the Nazareth uh, College Women's Hockey Team, NCAA D3 in Rochester. Chris is going to give a little chat about uh, the recruiting process from the college coach's perspective, which I think would be great for us to hear. Um, and then we have Olivia Zafudo. Uh, and Olivia is a multi-graduate of around this area. She graduated from the Nichols School in 2015, she graduated from Bison Hockey, and then most recently just graduated from Colgate, uh, where she played for the Colgate women's hockey team for four years, NCAA Division I. And Olivia is going to speak about um, the recruiting process from her perspective and the experience that she went through. So she'll talk about um, the experience that she had as she uh, progressed and made her way to Colgate. Um, and then I, I, we also asked Olivia to just maybe give a a little bit of a brief uh, talk about what it's like to be an NCAA athlete uh, on a daily basis when you're away at school. What's the demands and what's life like at, up at that level? Um, my name is Mike Beecher. For those of you that don't know me, I am the vice president of Bison Hockey. I'm also the acting girls hockey coordinator this year and maybe forever. Um, <laughs> I'm also a Bison parent. Uh, my daughter Lara plays on the 16U Black team. Uh, and then, uh, last but certainly not least, we have Jamie Prince, uh, who's the director of hockey here at the Nichols School, and also the coach of the boys' prep team here at Nichols, and also is a Bison parent with two daughters in our program. So um, that is kind of our start. Uh, and I will start with um, an overview, but let me just give you a little bit of an agenda. So. Um, I'm going to give you an overview on a couple key items, um, talk a little bit about Bison Hockey's recruiting strategy uh, going forward. Um, there's been some big changes to the NCAA rules in the past year that I'll give a brief overview on. Um, a little bit of a snippet between uh, Division I and Division III. And then um, I've got some statistics that I wanted to share with everybody in regards to Division I hockey and, and, and what the numbers are look, look like if you're interested in playing at that level. Um, and then we'll have Chris come up, um, and then Olivia, and then um, if we have a little time, uh, I'd rather actually spend more time listening to Olivia and Chris and take some questions than for me to talk about it, maybe from a parent's perspective, the recruiting process, having gone through it with um, my daughter, Lara, over the past few years. Um, but more than anything, we'd like to get questions uh, from you so that you get a chance to interact with Chris and Olivia and Jamie. Um, we have a, a whole list of actually a bunch of questions that we can start with that came in off the registration. Some of those questions I think will be answered by the presentations that you'll receive tonight. Um, and then at the end, we're gonna put up a screen and I'll have my phone number up there, um, my cell phone. So if anybody thought of something that they wanted to ask, um, you could certainly stand up and ask it. Maybe we're a little bit uh, closer than I, than I thought, but you can also text it to me and I'll read it and we'll have um, some of the panel answer it, okay? Uh, okay, so let's go right into um, the Bison recruiting strategy um, and talk a little bit about that. So, as we all know, uh, Shelly Looney, our longtime hockey director for the past five years, uh, recently left this year uh, to take the women's head coaching position at Lindenwood University. And, um, you know, quite frankly, we're, we're 
definitely in a transition in uh, our overall bison hockey program and certainly in our girls program in many ways in terms of running the program on a day-to-day -day basis um, and also with the way that we're approaching recruiting. Um, and um, we're taking the time to find the next Shelly, hopefully, um, and hoping that we do it the right way um, and find the right fit. We were very fortunate uh, to have someone like Shelly for so many reasons. Uh, not the least of which was her network of contacts and relationships in the women's college hockey world. And she helped so many of us, uh, so many of our players uh, uh, get spots uh, and uh, uh, places on teams, both in the D1 and D3 level. So it's a challenge for us at Bison Hockey to figure out where do we go from here. Um, but the intention is let's take our time and find the right person. Uh, and in the meantime, we need to continue to help our girls and our players with recruiting efforts. And that is what we're doing uh, and what you're kind of starting to see tonight being uh, one of those areas. So we have kind of a new strategy um, in, the, in the interim period while we find this next Shelly. Um, and it's really kind of focused around three central tenets. Uh, one is um, we're beginning to uh, kind of formalize the way we communicate to colleges. So in the past, Shelly was kind of her own networking dynamo and she would be on the phone on a daily basis to, uh, you know, it could be as many as 10 or 15 schools a day. Um, so that's, you know, not something that we're able to do at the moment. So we're finding ways um, to communicate and get the word out about our players to colleges in a different fashion. Uh, one of those is um, a number of our players have been involved in a, in a uh, research project where we're collating and aggregating all the contact information for all the D1 and D3 colleges in terms of the coach contact information and things like that. We, we're building that into a database and then uh, Bison will be doing some formalized outreach to those schools, letting uh, those schools know uh, who our players are, where they're playing on a weekly basis uh, with the intention that colleges will know where they are, who, the, who our players are and where they are, so that when they come looking and, and want to find out a little bit about a player, they'll know where to go. Um, so that's, that's one of the uh, initiatives. Um, the next initiative uh, was um, the build out of our um, recruiting information system, which um, for those that have seen this uh, and those that have been actively engaged in it, we started an initiative this year so that we built uh, individual recruiting pages for each player on the 16U age level. That's the age level that at the time uh, is most attractive to the schools. So every player that wishes to have one or wanted to have one has their own personal recruiting page built out. That's an index of pages available off our website that will link to each player's page so a college can come in, go right to bisonhockey.com slash recruiting and they're brought to that index page and then they can pick and choose any player that they'd like to learn a little bit more about and then they end up with a personalized recruiting page. So uh, you're seeing the top half of the page. Uh, Sophia Will is our, our model. Can you give me Thank you, Sophia. Super proud of you, Sophia. Voted to have the best recruiting page of all the girls by her peers. Oh, sorry. Well, that's what Sophia said. So, so uh, so each player has a page that was built off a template. They're able to uh, in, uh, put in all the uh, pertinent information for them, uh, their email address, their date of birth, their social media accounts, uh, their cell phone numbers, their schedule for their team, uh, whether they may or may not have a commitment, a little bit about themselves, so that any school that wants to learn a little bit about a specific kid can get some background on them before or maybe during the discussion process with them um, about uh, about their team and their college and their school. So we've gotten some really good feedback from some schools that have already utilized these pages to gather information about potential recruits. Um, and we're, we're hopeful that uh, that will continue. Um, and the girls put a tremendous amount of effort into it. Um, and we think it's a valuable resource both for them and, and for the colleges. So, um, so that's kind of where we're at. Um, there is one other thing which would be um, doing more seminars and a recruiting newsletter that's going to be started shortly so that we can continue to share information about the recruiting process. Uh, we gather and uh, we are sent a tremendous amount of information that is worthwhile, I think, for both players and families to learn about. Um, and as we move through this process, you'll, if you're signed up on our list, you'll be starting to get that information shared with you um, as a way to educate yourselves and uh, your, your daughters. So, um, and for the players themselves, of course, too. So those are things that are coming 
uh, down the pike. Uh, and we hope that it will help, uh, again, fill the gap with Shelly's departure and continue to provide opportunities for our girls um, to get college uh, hockey playing um, opportunities. So uh, the next part is a quick overview of some new NCAA recruiting rules that came to pass last spring. Um, so there were some new rules that went into effect uh, on May 1st of 2019. Um, the goal of those rules that were put in place, and this is at the Division I level, so this doesn't really count for Division III, but at the Division I level, they put some rules to constrain the uh, amount of early recruiting that was going on, uh, and ultimately to give student athletes more time to do research and choose the type of school that they wanted to go to instead of being pressured into committing to schools too early. It also, you know, honestly gives schools the chance to watch potential recruits a little bit longer to see how they develop uh, so that they aren't rushed into making a decision about recruiting or committing a girl before maybe she's ready or they're ready. Um, so they did put some, um, some significant new rules in place, primarily centered around four main categories. Um, coach communications, off-campus contact with players, official and unofficial visits, and then verbal offers and commitments. Um, and those were the four main categories of the way they tighten the rules up. So I'll give a brief uh, overview of, of each of those. So in coach communication, um, the new rule now is you can't have any kind of communication or interaction with a college um, prior to June 15th of that player's sophomore year. Um, so there can be no communication at all. Um, prior to that rule, uh, there was communication that was allowed um, and if a recruit called a coach, a college coach, and that coach actually picked up the phone, that basically they could have a free-for-all conversation. They could talk about anything. They could talk about commitments. They could talk about scholarships, the team, uh, at, at really almost any age. So, you know, last year before this rule was in place, I mean, I knew of girls in eighth grade who were talking to NCAA D1 college coaches, um, and certainly in freshman year as well. Um, and uh, the NCAA, uh, you know, ultimately started to look down on that and not feel that it was very healthy. So they put this new rule in place. So um, if you're a 2004 uh, birth year um, and you're in your sophomore year of high school, starting this June, or I should say June of after the first year, so next June um, 15th, then you'll be able to start to go and have conversations with uh, colleges again. Um, so that was a big change. Um, Off-campus contacts uh, can happen um, August 1st, as of August 1st, before your junior year, and generally off-campus contact means face-to-face -face contact with a coach, you know, who says more than hello to you as you pass by. So they can actually talk to you um, off the campus. Um, if you're at a tournament or you're on a visit or something like that, you can have a full and complete conversation with them about potential opportunities for scholarships, their school, their team, all of that. That can then happen after August 1st of your junior year. And then uh, for official and unofficial visits, uh, again, August 1st, uh, before your junior year, you're allowed to just begin to do official and unofficial visits. Um, there was a question about what the difference is. Um, an official visit essentially is a visit where you finance your own transportation to the school, you go of your own volition, um, and, that, and then you're, and you actually have a conversation with the coaches. So that would be an unofficial visit. An official visit is where the school may pay for you to come, may cover your expenses to come, and that would entail also communication uh, and conversations with the coaching staff. So as of August 1st of your junior year, before, excuse me, before your junior year, um, you can start to do official and unofficial visits. Uh, and then uh, the other one was verbal offers and commitments, uh, June 15th after sophomore year, the same time that you can start to talk to coaches, they can now then start to make verbal offers and commitments to you. Um, again, they put a stop to that uh, last May because, again, they were, you know, I mean, there were probably at least a dozen that we saw eighth graders committing to Division I schools last year across the country. Um, and, um, you know, great for those players, but, you know, more often than not, that's probably too early to be thinking about making a decision about where you're going to be in five years. Um, so um, they've tightened that up and I think probably better for, for, for all of us. Um, okay, so um, the next slide I'll, I'll, I'll just go through briefly is 
a little bit of um, contrast between um, Division One and Division Three sports. Uh, this would pertain um, to women's hockey as well. Um, these are things that um, we've picked up over the time um, and uh, a bit of a summary. So in Division I, um, generally, and, and maybe Olivia can talk a little bit more about this, but the, de the demands on your time from a scheduling perspective are significant if you're playing for a Division I uh, sport. Uh, some people refer to it as your sport, your life when you're on campus. Um, the big, one of the big uh, differences with Division I compared to Division Three, though, is um, athletic scholarships are allowed at the Division I level as opposed to Division Three, where they are not allowed or available. Um, in women's hockey, um, there are 18, a total of 18 full scholarships that are, that are allowed by the NCAA to be distributed to uh, a women's hockey team. Those scholarships can then be further split up into partial scholarships and up to 30 partial scholarships can be distributed uh, as long as they add up to the 18 full scholarships. So, you know, a player might get a full scholarship if they're a hot recruit. There might be players that get a half scholarship or a third. Uh, it just depends on the schools, uh, what they have to a lot and the value that they place uh, on that player. Um, but that is one of the big differences with Division I sports, the, the concept of full scholarships. Um, sometimes because the demands on the Division I athlete are so significant, uh, athletes can feel a little separated from the general college community. Uh, my niece uh, rode uh, Division I rowing at Northeastern and six days a week at 5.30 in the morning, she was up and on a campus bus to get over to the rowing center. And uh, that was her life for, that still is her life, but that was her life for the past three years. Um, she uh, had limited time to do the normal socializing and kind of college student things that a lot of her friends were doing. Um, but that was a decision that she made because she wanted to compete at a division one level. Um, but it is a significant sacrifice and, and, a, and a lot of time. Um, Ivy League schools are division one schools. Um, Certainly in women's hockey they are. Uh, the difference with uh, Division I schools and Ivy League schools is that Ivy Leagues, regardless of the fact that they're in Division I NCAA, um, do not offer athletic scholarships. So if you get recruited to go play Division I hockey at Harvard uh, or Princeton or, or thereabouts, um, uh, you're gonna be uh, probably trying to attract a need-based scholarship because athletic scholarships are just not available. So something to know. Um, in Division Three, I think most people would probably describe Division Three sports as a more well-rounded college experience. There's generally less of a demand on the, uh, the, the players, the athletes, uh, for time in regards to their, to their athletic side of their commitment to the school. Academics uh, take more of a lead, uh, some may say, uh, in, the, in Division Three. Uh, and uh, there's no athletic scholarships. However, the statistics that we've uh, pulled off NCAA um, websites is that about 80% of Division III athletes do receive some form of financial aid, whether it's in potential grants or need-based aid. So there is aid out there, it's just not gonna come in the form of an athletic scholarship. Uh, and uh, the, the one uh, thing that we've always heard is there is that sometimes in Division III athletes feel a little bit more part of the college community. They have a little bit more time, a little bit more flexibility in their schedule. Uh, to be just a part of a normal, red, everyday college student today. Um, and then my last slide before I turn it over to the panel, uh, this is a lot of numbers and I realize that this is not something that can be easily digested. We are gonna make this presentation available via email to all the attendees so that you can have this as a resource. There's a lot of good information in here. You'll, I think you'll see that from Chris's slides and some other slides that we have. Um, but this is a little bit of a research project that we did last year, kind of breaking down uh, Division I women's hockey teams, uh, just to kind of give a flavor for, the flavor for the amount of opportunities that are in uh, the Division I women's hockey world. So in 2018, there were 35 NCAA D1 women ice, ice hockey teams with about 863 active players and the average roster size is about 25. Now that number's changed a little bit because there, I think there were six new schools that came into D1 this year, officially came into D1, so these numbers were based on last year's numbers. Um, <clears throat> what's an interesting uh, stat to, to, to learn about with, with women's hockey at the D1 level 
Um, you know, U.S. schools, however, U.S. players only make up 59% of the NCAA D1 women's hockey uh, amount of players in the country. So 59% are U.S.-based players, 41% are from Canada and Europe. So that should give you a, a, a flavor for the mix of what you get on a, on, a, on a D1 women's ice hockey team. So what we did was we used uh, as, a, as a baseline what a normal breakdown is on an average youth hockey team in terms of the roster. So on an average youth hockey team, you got 10 forwards, six defense, two goalies, and a total of about 18 uh, on average. And the percentage breakdown is here, okay? And then what we did was we applied those percentages to the equivalent D1 total roster average from here, and then that gave us roughly a breakdown of the amount of forwards, defense, and goalies that you might find on a, an equivalent D1 team. Um, and then again, these are averages. Uh, and then we broke that down to uh, a class year for a recruiting year, call it. So if you have 25 players total on the team roster, that would tell you that on average, you'd have six and a quarter players in each recruit year. Now that's never probably the case, uh, just because every team is a little different. They might be heavy on juniors or they might be short on sophomores, but on an average basis, um, 6.25 players, and if you apply those same percentages, you'd end up with three and a half or so forwards recruited every year, two defensemen, almost a full goalie, uh, to give you a total of six and a quarter players per recruit year. Does that make sense? Almost a whole one. Okay. Sorry, Alex. Like and both Alex. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so if you were to then apply that number, 625, and you were able, and you then apply the percentage of USA uh, as, a, as a percentage of the roster, um, that would tell you that you get about two forwards who are U.S. kids, uh, of one and a quarter forwards that were defense, uh, a third of a goalie, uh, for about just under four kids on a roster of 6.25 that were U.S.-based kids, the rest would be international kids from Canada or, or Europe, okay? So then if you extrapolated that number to the number of teams that are out there, then it would tell you roughly that in, every, in any recruit you're going to have probably close to 72 forwards across the country that would be recruited to D1, 43 defensemen, 13, almost 14 goalies, a total of about 129, 128 total kids in the country who get recruited to D1. So that's, that's kind of where you stand if you want to play at that level, those are the numbers that you should understand in terms of what the opportunities are um, and what the competition is like for you at that level, okay? Does that make sense? Okay, enough for me. Um, I'd like to start working with the panel and bring the panel up here so we can start to get into the real good stuff. So our first, um, our first speaker, um, is Chris Baudo. Uh, as I mentioned, Chris is the head coach of Nazareth College in Rochester. Chris is a Buffalo native. He uh, started the Nazareth women's hockey program back two years ago. Um, prior to being the head coach of Nazareth, uh, he was the initial uh, hockey director for Selects Academy up at Bishop Kearney in Rochester, our, our, our great friends over in Rochester. Uh, uh, Chris has had some tremendous success uh, both at Selects and then also at Nazareth. Um, he was selected to be the United Collegiate Hockey Conference Coach of the Year. Was it in your first year, Chris? Yeah, it was our first year. In the first year. So his first year he started the program, recruited all the players from across the country. They won their conference and then he was named the Conference Coach of the Year. So that's pretty impressive stuff. Chris went to Hamilton College, graduated in 2000. He played four seasons on the men's hockey team and was twice the team MVP. So, uh, without further ado, Chris Bauda. Yeah, thank you for having me. I apologize for my voice. Uh, I actually feel fine, but for whatever reason, my voice is gone. Um, Interesting that we did not win the league, though I appreciate that. Uh, we're in a league with we're in a league with Elmira, which is like the evil empire, and <laughs> seemingly very difficult to beat. We play them tomorrow. If you're bored, tickets are free at the Iceplex at Bill Gray's. Feel free to come down. We need all the support we can get. First, real quick, I just want to get a show. There seems to be a, a pretty wide range of age here. How many how many current seniors are here? Any? 
Juniors, current juniors. Current sophomores, younger than current sophomores. Fantastic. Good. Good stuff. Gives me a little bit of sense. Well, when we spoke before, we talked a little bit about just giving you a coach's perspective. You know, I'll try to be concise, yet at the same time thorough, uh, and then maybe leave, leave some curiosity for questions later as we get done with the panel. In looking at just the, the, the process, the first thing that came to my mind was is allowing you into our head as we try to figure out that number we were just talking about, how many kids are you gonna bring in? And why do I tell you this? I tell you this because ultimately you can do that research on your own. You can go to collegehockeystats.net, you can go to USCHO, you can look at our rosters, look at the year you'll be entering, and try to get a sense of how many are we gonna be looking to bring in? Because it is a numbers game. You know, there, there is that yield component to it that we have to consider. And so ultimately, we try to look at one, what's our graduation? But at the Division three level, we also have to look at what's our attrition. So for example, at, at Nazareth, we have a really strong nursing program and a really strong physical therapy program. Those are very daunting majors for, for the young women who are a part of our program. And it would be really foolish of me to think that we won't lose one or two as they jump into their junior year and they're doing clinicals and hospitals and they're trying to make it all work. And it's not because they don't love hockey as much as you love hockey. It's just as we just spoke about, you know, they're at NAS because they want a degree in a certain field and at some point they may have to make that choice. So we're obviously looking at the numbers we get rid of in terms of graduation, but then those we might lose. But then we're looking at where do we stand and where do we want to go? You know, Nazareth, we're, we're a second year program. We're fortunate to get off a, to a really good start last year, finishing second in our league. Um, but where do we want to go, right? Do, do we want to become, you know, the Elmiras of the world? Do we want to become the Norwiches of the world? who are perennial elite programs every single year. And we have to figure that out. And it leads me to that kind of that, that third bullet, which is the expectations of players. We recruit players who we really like as humans and as players. But when you get there, it is incumbent upon you to perform, to, to meet expectations, almost make our feelings about you accurate and true. And it's our job to develop you and communicate with you when things are going great, or maybe when they're not going as great. But there is the expectation that you will earn your playing time every single year. And if everything goes perfect and we're spot on with our recruiting and you're spot on with your commitment level and your development over time, there, there's not an issue at all. But I, I guess I'm being really blunt when saying you have to perform if the team is gonna maximize its potential. And I, I don't say that to scare anyone, uh, but it is the reality, and better for you to hear it from a college coach than, uh, than someone to sugarcoat that for you. So we do have to figure out how many we need, and then we have to figure out how many do we need to recruit to get to that number. We don't have scholarships. And the first time I meet you and I meet your family, I don't say, well, how much do you think you can pay? That is a process that goes through our admissions office, our financial aid office, and we have to then couple that with who we are as an institution. So NAS is a great school, it rates very highly, but we're not Williams College, which is uh, along with Amherst College, the number one rated liberal arts school in the country. There's high demand for those schools. For us, there's high demand, just not as high. So we have to figure out if we need to get seven kids how many do we need to bring into the pipeline? And again, you know, being pretty transparent with you, if we have you on campus, we like you. That's very genuine, that's very sincere. But what we don't know is, one, can you get into the program you wanna get into? And two, will you get the financial aid you need? And three, how will that financial aid match up against said school X, Y, or Z? And so we have to go through a process of authentically getting to know you, authentically uh, cultivating a relationship. But then in the end, we don't know really how it's gonna shake out over time. So when you, re you see me write this up here and say, well, how many do we need to recruit? We're not over recruiting. 
We just have to play the percentages relative to kids who will either maybe not get the aid package they need, or the truth is, and I'll, I'll speak to this later, good players have options. And so if you need seven kids and you recruit eight, but four of them go to Norwich and one goes to Manhattanville and two didn't get eight, you're down to one, you're down to one kid. So there is a yield component to it, and I do want you to know that for all of us as Division III schools, coaches, when we get kids to campus, that's a genuine level of interest. And then we just have to let it play itself out because we don't have the scholarship to offer to see if it's a good fit for you, not only personally, academically, but financially. So that's kind of how we come up with our number, trying to figure out how many we want to bring in the pipeline, and then how many we hope to yield from that for our recruiting class. So for example, at NAS next year, our recruiting class is done. Uh, for 2020, we have four kids coming in total. It was a small class for us, and we were able to get all of them to go early decision. So fingers crossed that that means something, and they hold to their word. Real quick about the process, just so you have a sense of what you should be thinking about, especially if you're the juniors who are here, right? You should be starting to communicate with college coaches. Be an advocate. That could be part of the do slide. Be an advocate for yourself. You have these recruiting pages, which is fantastic. You can throw a link in your email, um, but advocate for yourself. And also expect that over the next probably three to four months in the Division III world, we will begin really reaching out in earnest to that 2021 class. We'll, we'll finish up the 2020s, we'll know where we stand, and then we'll start to build those relationships with the next group. Hopefully, if someone's reaching out to you, they're inviting you to campus to take a visit, talking about maybe the winter, the spring. Uh, we like to try to get kids in in the spring or earlier because we want them to be there when students are on campus, even though they still haven't finished their junior year necessarily. But get a sense of the facilities and, and determine a shared timeline. So if I could give you any other advice, especially the juniors with their parents, begin to think about when you want to know where you're going. And you don't have to feel forced on your timeline. But you want to have that conversation with the coach. Again, specifically at Nazareth, we don't mandate that kids go ED1, but we certainly like when they go ED1 because we know they're really committed to us, we know that they want to be at the institution, and we know, you know verbally at least, that they're going to be coming the following year. But if you're a kid who you know, doesn't want to decide that early, let the coach know that. Let the coach know, you know what, I'm thinking about, you know, maybe December, January. I mean, we have some kids who come in in the spring and they said, I want to decide in September before I start my senior year. That's great. We know that. We can make a decision on you based on that timeline. Or we can give you an update at your timeline of where you stand within our process. But that transparency uh, deadline you know, what we're thinking as coaches and what you're hoping for as a family really helps us coordinate the communication and the ultimate kind of decision-making process of where does this kid fit. After that, you know, we'll continue to view, fam view players, we'll continue communication with players, we're at all the tournaments that you're at. Uh, and probably around, I don't know, September, October, after Stony Creek, after a couple of those uh, U.S. Canada Cup, Two Nations type tournaments, we're going to start to determine kind of our order with admissions and try to start to get what you'll see here are some pre-reads for families. So again, piece of advice, if you're going the Division Three route, you can, for the most part, get a pre-read on your application. I'm sure that's not universal, so don't hold me to it. But you can get a sense academically, will I get in? And typically, what will my aid package look like based upon the aid structure within the financial aid office? That's super helpful for us. And sometimes it stinks, because a kid we love, just it's not gonna work. But at least we know that come September, October maybe, and we can now shift our attention to somebody else. And as much as it might stink for you if you wanna go to school X, you know, kind of the, the, the kick to the gut only lasts so long, and then you're able to kind of refocus yourself and figure out maybe what is more into your, your wheelhouse and what could be a better fit for you. After that, pre-read, there's the potential. Again, every school is different for being offered a spot. Definition-wise, what does that mean? It means 
you're part of our recruiting class, we're offering you a roster spot for the next year, uh, and you know that if you commit to that, uh, based on the pre-read, you're gonna get in, the packaging looks good, that, that you're gonna be part of the program a year later. And then the potential deadline for the decision that we talked about. Somewhere in there, and I forgot to put it last night, is uh, an official or an unofficial visit. We can do official visits in Division Three. Kids get one official visit, I think, per school. So we can have a kid once, and we can pay for your transportation to get there. We can give you 40 bucks a day, I think it is, to spend on food, or maybe go bowling with the girls, or go out to dinner with the team. Uh, but we will do official visits. And you're from Buffalo, so that's easy for us, but like we're not paying for people's flights from Alaska to come. I mean, the budget just isn't there for the Division Three world, as much as I wish it was. So some of the do's and don'ts, real quick. Advocate for yourself, okay? As a human, you can do that. But here's the advice I'll give you. How many of you, by a show of hands, how many of you enjoy reading emails that are eight paragraphs long? Raise your hand if you enjoy that. Me neither. I don't enjoy it either. So when you reach out to colleges, be concise. Be concise, and my other piece of advice, ask a couple questions. Because if you ask questions, you then elicit a response. The coach can't just sit there and say, oh, there's another name. The coach really should feel obligated to get back to you with some answers to your questions, and then you start the relationship back and forth. Keep us posted on how you're doing. Right now, we're in the crunch of our season, so you know a lot of the hard work that we do is in the fall with calling kids, emailing, texting kids. We try to do it in, the, in season, but it's really hard with everything that's going on, film, breakdown, um, game planning, all of that. So just advocate for yourself. Keep a journal as you go through. All the schools will start to look alike. Get a sense of what stuck out to you, why could you see yourself there, how was your interaction with the coaching staff, what questions were left unanswered, and then when you're kind of wrapping it all up after three, four, five, seven, ten visits, you can look back and, and you'll start to decipher maybe one, what differentiates each school, but also what are some patterns that have stuck out that you've really enjoyed. <clears throat> maybe you've enjoyed the smaller school environment, maybe you like the bigger school in a city, but over time, as you visit, it's gonna be hard to keep track if you don't start to journal a little bit about the experiences. Respond to communication. You know, like we, we know that you look at your phone a lot during the day. Uh, we also will give you the benefit of the doubt that our text message could get lost in 54 Snapchats and you know, 27 Tic Tacs or whatever that thing is called. <laughs> right? You know, it's funny, I said that to our players the other day. I said, what's this Tic Tac thing all about? And they all laughed. But anyway, I don't, I don't know what it is, but we're going to start an account. I'll tell you that. Our assistant's starting a TikTok account soon. Big time. Maz is progressive. Remember that if you're here. But communicate. Respond. And be honest as you go. Be honest with the coaching staff about kind of where, you, where they stand uh, or where you stand with them. And we'll be honest with you about it. You know, we're not going to we're in the room and be like, yeah, we just don't like you. But we'll be honest and say, listen. Right now you're in the middle of our path, and we like you, we think you could fit here, but you know there's a few players who are rated ahead of you. And you can let us know the same thing. And it's our job to try to convince you in a way to move up those ratings if in fact we want to get you here. And try to enjoy the process. I read an article recently that says you're the most stressed generation ever. Congratulations on that. That's a real win for you. Try to enjoy what you're doing. It's fun to go out and take a look at places. You will end up somewhere. I, I can almost promise that. You'll end up in a place that's a good fit for you. And I, I'll be honest again off the slide here. The thing, one of the things I admire about the women's game after coaching in the men's game for probably 12, 15 years is there is more of a pure joy in the women's game. The women who play for us love to play. They love to be around each other. They don't like to lose, right? But they don't harbor that. They don't, they don't identify with that nearly as much as when I was on the men's side. They just love competition and they love to play. And you'll find a place if you enjoy the process where you have that experience. 
as a player, a couple of recruiting dues, know who you are and don't try to be something different. Work on the weaknesses of your game, certainly. That's why you have practice every day. But have some self-reflection with your family, with your coach, and figure out where your strengths lie and play that way. Again, it doesn't mean you pigeonhole yourself into being a mucker and a grinder or a scorer or whatever, but it means that you know what you do well and you're not trying to be a jack of all trades. You're trying to do what you do well while getting better at the other stuff. Try to be consistent. So generic that you never know when we're there to watch. We want kids who bring it every day because, I don't know, someone raise your hand if you're okay answering a question. Who likes to talk? Perfect. How many games will you play this year between, where do you go to school? Here. Nichols? So between Nichols and you play for the Bisons? Yep. How many games do you think you'll play? Like, I don't know, is 50 a good answer? No. 100? <laughs> Not that many, probably. 76. Right, we're going to go on 76. I like that. It's ballpark, right? 76. We play 25. We need players who are great every day. Like, we don't get to take a day off. We took a day off last Tuesday. We took a period off last Tuesday. And we lost 4-1 to one to a team that's good, definitely good. And it's not a knock on them. But we outshot them 42-20. to 20, And we lost 4-1 to one because we gave up two goals in the first. It's a learning process. I'm not mad. No one's mad. You grow from it. But in the end, you need to be consistent with how you play. And if you're consistent, I promise you, college coaches will love that because we know what we're gonna get every single day. And as a coach, I mean, holy smokes, that's a blessing when you can look, try to get a kid, you know what you're gonna get, you know what you're gonna get from them. Be a great teammate. We can see that on the bench. We can see it on the ice. We can see if you're giving people fist pumps. We can see if you're not on the power play or you're still excited or you're moping on the bench. Be a great teammate because it's not always gonna be highs when you get to college, right? We're not in this position now, but for those of you who are the juniors, if you ended up at NAS, that's our first group of four classes. So we'll have seniors, juniors, sophomores, and freshmen. It's in meritocracy. I don't care what age you are. If you're effective and more effective, you'll play. But it will be more challenging as a 17, 18-year-old freshman to come in and just dominate or just have an immediate impact. So how are you when those tough times hit? We're going to love you and support you through it, but how will you respond as a player and a teammate? And this is just for me, I don't know if other coaches agree, but display that you love to compete. Like, love to compete. Fun is hard work, competing is fun. Show that in the way you play. I watch players and they wonder what we look for. The two best players I ever recruited on the boys' side, the first reason I recruited them is after they scored a goal. The first time I saw them play, there was just a genuine enthusiasm. Like, not Selly, pick up the ice, sprinkle it on your head, bow and arrow. It was like, they probably saying a swear word. And like, yeah, like, they were fired up. It's because they love to compete. We want players who love to compete. Because we love what we do. We love to teach, we love to mentor, we love to be around young people. So we want kids, in turn, who also love to try to be, you can't be perfect, but try to be your best self every day. Some of the don'ts, and then I'll get out of here quick. Um, don't expect everyone to come to you. That's a myth. Certainly if you're like really, really good, people come to you. But that's like 5% of the population. And if you're in the other 95%, I'm the old guy in that boat. No one was really after me when I was 18 years old. Things worked out just fine. So know that they're not gonna come to you, advocate for yourself. Don't subscribe to the fake news. It's really like a cultural reference right there, fake news. Um, if they want you, they'll pay for you. It doesn't work that way, at least in Division Three. I wish it did, because man, the job would be a lot easier. But it's dependent upon your grades, your test scores, and then every place is different. You know, if you end up in a nest cap, they typically meet your need if you can get into school. But at most of the small privates, there's this tiered scholarship structure and a smidge of need-based financial aid. So at Nazareth, the average kid on our team probably pays anywhere between $26,000 and $35,000. Nobody pays the full 52, everybody gets something. But 
We could have the best player in the world, and I can't tell admissions, school X has got her paying 8,000. Can we get her to that point? They're just not gonna. Because for them, it's just fiscally irresponsible uh, at a time when a lot of private colleges are closing. Don't display poor body language on the ice. Again, be a great teammate. Don't be that parent, parents who are here. I mean, honestly, like I got into it with a Chicago mission parent at the tournament. I'm getting old, so I'm getting frustrated with all this stuff. Kid got, I don't know, kid came in, and, uh, and the good kid's good players, I'm not knocking her. Does anyone know who Abby Murphy is? Abby Murphy, she plays on the US team. She's like legit, like really good. She comes flying back on a back check, kind of tries to get in through the kid's hands, and her stick just like, whacks against the boards, the kid like pancakes. Didn't hit her hard, there's a lot of noise. Dad, dad's up in the mouth. I don't know if it's her dad. She's like, dude, what is that all about? Tell me what's going on. So I was like sitting there and I was like, all right, I'll tell you what's going on. <laughs> and like, you can't back check someone and make a noise like a bomb just went off. You bring attention to yourself and they're gonna call a penalty because the kid's lying on the ground. That's just the way the game operates. What is your role as a parent? You should be involved. All the research says that we need to engage you as coaches, and we will. But in the end, you should serve as a guide for your daughter, as a sounding board for your daughter, as a way to differentiate for your daughter. But in the end, your daughter's gonna spend four years at the institution, even though for the most part, you'll probably be writing the check. She has to be happy, but she needs to know that you're there to support her and help her figure it out, because that's where the anxiety comes in. It's the fear of making the wrong decision. They have to know they're not gonna make the wrong decision. That there are very few wrong decisions to be made, actually. And if you go there and invest yourself, you'll feel like it's the best decision you ever made. And then don't sabotage yourself via social media. We do look at social media. Do I have a recruit board with every kid's name and I monitor it every day? No. But when we get into it with a kid and we are really deep into the recruiting process, either I or our assistant will look and we'll see what you're posting. Because it's a little bit of that idea that you are who you are when no one's looking, right? Your character is what you do when no one's looking. Well, I know everyone's looking on social media, but at the same time, that gives a reflection of you as a person. Be aware of that. Be aware of that. And finally, what do we want? That was another question I was asked before this. We want good people. I encourage you to ask that question wherever you go. Because every coach will tell you, they'll say, Sally, we want character kids here. I encourage you to say back, coach, what does that mean? For us at NAS, it means we want people who are kind. As cheesy as that sounds, we want people who are kind to others. We want people who are patient. Patient and give the benefit of the doubt when they're with the same group of girls for five and a half months. You all live it. It's not perfect, right? We don't want drama, but it's kind of inevitable. But there's less of it if we have the right people who are like, you know what? I heard she said that about me, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to her about that. I, I don't think that's true. So we want kids who are patient. We want kids who are trustworthy. We want kids who are balanced in their approach to life. That's what it means to us. And that, I don't think that makes us unique, but you'll find a differentiation if you ask that question to other coaches. And then from the hockey end, I just wrote the car analogy. Um, you know, if you go in the parking lot right now, there's, a, there's Ford, Chevy, Buick, Cadillac, you know, Toyota. There's blue, green, pink, red, orange. There's SUVs, there's sedans. This is the same thing as buying a car. What I like, Jamie's not gonna like. Right, what Jamie likes, maybe Olivia sees something different. You have to find the place that values you as a person and as a player, that values your style of play. Plenty of players that I've passed on over the years who come to the rink and play against us and score goals against us. That happens. Sometimes you get it wrong. But in the end, are we looking for the same thing? Eh, kind of, but we're all looking for something a little bit different that fits our style of play, our approach to the game. I think 
Yeah, know yourself and be yourself. And now I'd like to introduce Olivia as a food. Are you able to do that? Perfect. Native of Niagara Falls, right down the road here. She's a Bison's alum. And graduated from the Nichols School in 2015. How many years out until you're uh, eligible for the Hall of Fame? Five, six? Ten years, ten years. You'll be the Mariano Rivera, first ballot Hall of Fame. She then went on to Colgate, where they play free, in case you didn't know on the hashtags. <laughs> and had an outstanding career. And actually, I'll say, you know, play for an incredible staff there with Greg and the whole group. And, uh, and I don't really know Olivia that well, but from a distance, I'm certain is very proud and to be part of the group that led Colgate to the rise of being a, a national powerhouse. Pretty great that she's a three-time academic All-American or All-Academic Team ECAC. That's a lot of points for a defenseman. I didn't have that many as a forward, so kudos. And was drafted by the Buffalo Buttes in 2018. Olivia, you staying there? I'm gonna stay here. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Let's give her a hand, though, huh? Let's give her a hand. Uh, Olivia, thank you so much. All righty. Hello, everyone. How are you? Good. Good. All right. Um, so I'm gonna give you a little bit about my journey as a player. Um, as Chris mentioned, um, everyone's gonna have a different journey, so I'll give you a little bit of background about mine. Um, I was lucky enough, some of you may know Dave Smith, he coached at Canisius College and then um, is now at RPI. He was one of my coaches that kind of coached me through the whole college recruiting process um, and knew a lot about it, as well as Scott Welch, who I'm sure a lot of you guys are familiar with. Um, so I had two coaches that were very um, connected in the college, college hockey world, which was great for me. But um, the first thing that Dave ever told me uh, was what Chris mentioned was starting a journal. So Dave had me um, inter uh, research a few schools on the internet, say, okay, this is, look up a little bit of information. I had, I had to write down, well, not I had to, I wanted to. I wrote down the coaches, the school, what, if it was big, small, what kind of academics they offered, and um, kind of started in that sense. So I wrote that down, went through, maybe picked out mm, seven to 10 schools that I thought maybe I'd be interested in before I even, knew anything about college. Like I, I came to Nichols and I was like, oh, maybe I'll play in college. That'd be awesome. Like that was what I wanted to do. And then it kind of started to become a reality. And I was like, okay, this is when it's going to be serious. So um, started the journal um, after starting the journal. So rules were a little different in my age. Uh, we could be recruited in grade 10, I believe. Um, so when I was playing U16, which I know some of you are playing, um, I started talking to colleges. They um, reached out to our coaches, to myself, um, and kind of set up phone calls. So a lot of, this was, social media was becoming more and more a thing. Um, to get around the rules, you might see a Twitter DM here and there from colleges. That was a little weird. I hope that doesn't happen now uh, with the new rules. But um, kind of felt the pressure that way. So when I was, I was talking to schools, it was, I was always so nervous. I was like, oh man, like I got this, this call coming up. I'm like taking notes, like, what am I gonna say on the phone? Um, honestly, you don't need to be nervous. Coaches, Chris will tell you, they just wanna have a conversation, right? It's just a normal conversation, they're asking a little bit about yourself. Um, for me though, I was I was told like, and, and wanted to, I, I found, a, I, I had researched a, a little bit about the schools, I knew the coach, um, I knew what the schools offered, um, and I just had a conversation. Maybe they asked you, as Chris mentioned, what kind of player you are, Where, what's your role on your team? Um, some different questions, and then I always had a couple questions for the, the coach. Uh, that was one piece of advice Dave, Dave had given me, was maybe have some questions about the school, the team, academics, you name it. Um, so I, I started talking to a few schools, and then I visited some of those schools that I was seriously interested in um, to figure out, okay, do I want a big school, do I want a small school, city, in the middle of nowhere, which is where I ended up, uh, what, what do you want? So. I went and visited probably uh, maybe seven, six to seven schools. Um, and a lot of these trips uh, were with coaches, so I'd, I'd go and um, set up a time and date with the coaches. Um, usually some girls were, I tried to do it when the girls were around because it's way better to see colleges when the players are there. 
um, or students are there, you kind of get a day in the life. Um, set up the, the uh, tours, talk to the coaches, and then kind of decided, okay, Start narrowing, started narrowing it down after I, decided, after I saw the school. So I wanted a small school. That was my one thing I noticed. I, I didn't want to really be in a city. Um, and I wanted a, a tight-knit community. So for those of you that go to Nichols, we know the community is a big aspect at Nichols. Uh, it's a small school. It's, I kind of kind of wanted the same thing in a college as what I got at Nichols. Um, so when I was visiting, uh, I had, so I, Colgate was, Colgate and Ohio State were my, my final two that I came down to. Complete opposites. Ohio State's a huge school, for those of you who don't know, huge city, big everything. And then Colgate was a small school, um, tight knit community, the team was awesome, loved the coaches, um, came down to those two. So in the whole process, I, there were, it was, I narrowed it down from four um, to two, so kind of seven to four to two-ish, and I was sitting there, and the whole time I, I was nervous. I was like, man, like, how am I gonna decide? Like, I don't know where I wanna go to school. Like, I didn't wanna make this, the decision because I didn't wanna upset anyone. This is where my advice is, don't worry about what, what, what other people are gonna say. Don't worry about if your teammates are committing to certain colleges. Um, do what's gonna make you happy. So the whole time, Dave, I was talking to Dave, and he was just kind of saying, like, see where you see where you're going to fit in at the, at the school. So, what's your role going to be on the team? Um, where do they see you fitting in? You can ask that as, as when you're being recruited. Where where do you see me fitting into the, the team? Because that's important, right? Like, do you want to go to a school where eh, you might not play that much? You really got to work hard every day and work your way up. Do you want to go to a school? You might be a big fish. Um, you're going to play all the time. They see you. You're, the team's revolving around you, like whatever it is, you can ask the coach, where do you see me fitting in? So I had those conversations. Um, here we are back down to my final two, Ohio State, Colgate. I'm like, wow, like, how am I gonna decide? Well, what did I say before? I wanted a small school, I wanted a tight knit community. Um, I wanted a really good school academically. And for those of you who don't know, um, Colgate's a really good school. Um, <laughs> The team was awesome. Like a, I absolutely loved the team, the coaches when I was there. So I, I knew in my gut, I was like, okay, I want to go to Colgate. Like, why, why, aren't, why aren't I deciding? Like, I'm, I'm feeling nervous. I'm, I'm like feeling the pressure. And then finally, I was like, okay, that's where I want to go. But to make the decision, and I'm not recommending this to anyone. Um, I put the two schools in a hat. <laughs> Ohio State and Colgate. I picked Ohio State, and I was. God, are you kidding me? Like, why did I pick them? And that's when I knew, and my gut was coming out, like I knew Colgate was the answer. So, I'm, I'm, again, I'm not recommending this, but if you're coming down to two, and, and, and David always told me, imagine yourself, like go to bed thinking, okay, I wake up in the morning and I'm a Colgate Raider. Go to bed, I wake up and I'm an Ohio State Buckeye. Like, whatever it is, like, think about how you feel waking up that way. Mine came out of a hat. Okay, I picked out of a hat. It worked. I love Colgate. It was the best decision I ever made. But deep down, like you're gonna know where you want to go to school. Now that's my my process. It's gonna be different from a lot of yours. I went to school with 20. Well, in my time, there's probably 40 other girls. We had girls that reached out to the coaches all the time, like emailed back and forth. Did completely different. Had a completely different process than I did. Um, and ed we ended up at the same place, right? We, we all loved it. But part of the biggest thing for me was always like the team culture, um, knowing knowing what you're getting yourself into. I had, I'm helping coach, for those of you who don't know, I'm helping coach the Nichols and the Niagara 19U team. Um, and we have girls, like, people are saying, oh, I went to the school and I have the culture. Like, I got a weird vibe. I'm like, well, that's maybe a red flag. Like, know, know what you're getting yourself into, right? Get to know the, the team a little bit if you can while you're there. Talk to the coach, see, see kind of the vibes that the coaches are, and the players are giving up. Um, that was kind of my process. Um, I have a lot of advice slash do's and don'ts that overlap with Chris. The, the one don't I had, and this came from Dave too, and he always told my parents, and I was really happy he told them, was don't be the one talking the whole time when you're visiting schools. 
parents. Let, let the kids be the kids. I mean, at Colgate, we do, when, when people are visiting, there are sometimes two coaches on, on the tour, and one might be talking to parents, one might be talking to a player. Let, let your daughter do the talking, ask the questions. I'm not saying don't ask any questions. Ask, ask some questions, but a lot of uh, what the coaches are, why they're bringing in is to, to get to know your daughter. Obviously, the whole family, like if, if you're a family, you're committing to the school, but uh, a lot of it is around the daughter. Focus on your daughter. Um, and that's when the do's was be yourself, ask questions. Uh, one piece of advice, this was a big thing at Colgate. Uh, when you're with the girls, when you're touring, if you're at, on a tour, you're at a school and the coaches aren't around, don't think, oh, the coaches aren't around, I can be however I want, I can act however I want, I can sit there on my phone, like, finally I have free time to be on my phone. The players talk to their coaches. I toured plenty of girls at Colgate and I was like, man, coach, like, I don't know about this girl, like, this is, like, everyone talks to them. And, and it wasn't like you're trying to sabotage a player, but the coaches ask for your honest feedback. You want your program to be the best it can be and bring in the best people it can be to bring in. So that was a big uh, component of the college process for, for Colgate at least, and I'm sure a lot of other schools. Um, and then just, as Chris mentioned, character, GPA. If you have two girls that are really good at hockey, one has a 4.0 and one's like struggling in school, it's an easy choice for the coach. It's an easy, oh, they're gonna get in, they're not gonna struggle here. GPA is important, your character is important, so keep them up. If you have any questions? Yep. Olivia, tell a little bit about what's the normal day in life. Oh yeah, I forgot about that one, yeah. Um, <laughs> day in the life, that'll... Day in the life, uh, well, I can speak for Colgate at least. Um, academically, we, at Colgate, so, Typically, you're in school. Um, you go to 8:30ish is the earliest class you'll take, and classes end wrap up at around four. So you're not in school all day. You maybe have one or two classes a day. Maybe you have none. Those, those are good days. Uh, maybe you have no <laughs> classes, which is um, then you have more time to do whatever. But on those days you have no classes, you, you're probably doing your homework to catch to catch up to get ahead or be on on task on schedule with where your class are at. So. Go to school um, in the morning, afternoon, typically, I don't know, at least a half an hour before I was our, our rule at Colgate. You have to at least be there half an hour before, get ready. Um, typically I was there an hour before practice. Uh, in the training room, a lot of times people are doing, I hate to say it, rehab or prehab before they're injured, um, working with trainers, <coughs> just getting prepared, foam rolling, stretching, you name it. Or you're just there hanging out with the girls. Like our at Colgate, um, we absolutely like everyone was like best friends. Like we hung out a lot, and there was drama occasionally. But like for the most part, everyone was super close and wanted to hang out with each other. So we'd go to the go to the rink. I'd say an hour early. Um, you're on the ice for any schools between 45. Colgate, we were very. Um, it was very concise. We, we had short practices. We knew the practice plan before going on the ice. We tried not to spend a lot of time at the board and keep the pace up. So it was 45 minutes of like competing the whole time. Um, sometimes you're on the ice 45 minutes to an hour and a half. It depended on the day. Um, but you have to be ready to at least probably be on the ice for an hour. If you're on for 45 minutes, usually you stay on for a little bit after. Um, and then depending on the day, usually two times a week at the minimum, the bare minimum, um, you're lifting, so you go to practice, maybe you have lift after. Uh, lift, depends, 45 minutes to an hour and a half probably as well. So now you're at it, you're getting up to close to three hours just of strictly practice and lift. Um, so that would probably take you to about seven at night, maybe go back to the rink, shower, and then it's time to eat, get close to eight, now it's time to start homework. So that's where you see, uh, you only have, if you don't have any classes, you have one class that day, you better be doing your homework during the day because at night you're, you're gonna have to cook or you go to the dining hall and then you're doing your homework. Um, the typical game week though, Mon so, so in the ECAC, which is one of the leagues, division one, um, we played Friday, Saturday, 
just about every weekend. Um, so we have Sundays off, Monday through Thursday practice. Special teams would be probably one day, uh, maybe skills one day. At Colgate, we did a lot of small area games. So I'm a very uh, huge advocate of small area games. I love competing, as Chris mentioned. That was a big way for the coaches to see who was going to be playing in the games. And one of the biggest things at college is not everyone's playing, right? Like, they're going to put the best uh, team or players on the ice, the, the people that are trying hard, the people with the good body language, the people that aren't slamming their sticks or getting mad because they're not on power play or penalty kill or this or um, out when you're, you have one goal, you're, you're down by a goal at the end of the game. Like, coaches uh, aren't going to play yet if they see something they don't like. So the Monday through Thursday, you're, you're out, you're working your butt off trying to showcase yourself so that on Friday you're dressing, you're in the lineup, you're playing. Um, and then Fridays and Saturdays obviously are game days. Game days are awesome. Um, you usually have breakfast, we would do um, some kind of team stretch, walk, we call it activation, a little mind game or something to get you going in the morning. Uh, hang out for a little bit with the girls. I wasn't a big homework on game day girl, left that for Sunday. Um, you have a pregame meal, and then you're at the rink two hours before the game. So I know a lot of you guys probably are there an hour before. Two hours sometimes didn't even seem like enough when you're in college. Um, you're there, you're focused, you're ready to go. Um, so, yeah. Uh, so we've got some time uh, for questions and answers, if you'd like to take some time. Um, I've got a couple here that, um, like I said, we, we received in the registration process. If you would like to ask a question um, and you're comfortable and you want to just raise your hand, we can just do it that way. Julia, of course. <laughs> you, of course go I for it. <laughs> Okay, so if you want a college to notice you, what should you do? Like if you're looking at <laughs> <laughs> so the course of a hockey game? Um, like if you want to go to that college. Because like a, I know a bunch of coaches who say like different things, but like what if you want a college to notice you, like you email them or something like that, like what should you do to get them to notice you that you wanna, you're interested in their school? I think that you know, starting the process by advocating for yourself and, and reaching out via email I think is a really great start. I think that you're, I don't want to say you're fortunate because you've earned the right to be a part of such a, a great program like the Bisons, um, but the Bisons are well known, right? So when we're reading emails from kids, we're looking for kind of those trigger words or the moments in the player's life, meaning you know, they play for the Bisons, it's a really good team, maybe they you know, maybe they're, they've been fortunate to go to a national festival, something like that. Um, but if you if you put yourself out there and you've got some information that intrigues the interest, then the coach will will know who you are. And then it really does come down to when they, when they go watch you play. Well, how do you play? How do you do? And that's where, as I said before, I think you need to know yourself and play to your strengths. And uh, and honestly, it's it's this weird balance. Be honest with you like you have to play to your strengths do your best but also be graceful with yourself within that game if you're not playing your best because it's not the end of the world the one thing that is fascinating about women's hockey is that the same teams play each other at every <coughs> turn so legitimately like from Stony Creek up and through the two nations cup we just go watch the same teams play each other again. There's like no new faces, there's no new people. We know all of them. And sometimes that's a good thing because we get to watch a kid over and over. Sometimes it's like, I've seen this kid before and it's the same thing. So ultimately, uh, don't fret if you have one bad game. Just push through it and try to be your best self the next time. So. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna add to that a little bit. I think, you know, the, the advice I've been, I give our players all the time is you need to make sure that you perform, but you also need to make sure that you 
you play within yourself and play within the team concept. We have conversations all the time of guys will come down in a two-on-one. They know that they should make the pass. Instead, they say, oh, I need to score because I need to be noticed. They take the shot that they shouldn't take instead of making the pass that they should make. And they don't understand that every coach in the building knows that they just made a selfish play to try to get themselves noticed instead of making the right play. Which at the end of the day, if you just make the right plays, that's what gets you noticed. It's, it, there, when you talk about a delicate balance, it's, it's playing within yourself, being effective, but also because they see you over and over again, seeing the same player over and over again is really important. Not seeing, I showed up on one day and you were amazing, and then the next day you weren't, and then there was a little bit in the middle. They wanna know what they're gonna get, and they wanna see you perform at your best. And if you can be amazing every day, that makes the coach's job so much easier on a coach who's playing. Um, but we also know that we're kids, or we're dealing with kids, and they're not gonna be amazing every day. But there needs to be a level of consistency in the game. It's an interesting point, too, and I'll just uh, kind of follow it up by saying, as college coaches, we will ask your coaches, uh, if we can, if we can find the time before the game, to tell us about your structure. What type of four check are you trying to run? What's your D zone coverage? Because we want to know that a kid is able to play within a level of structure. And it doesn't mean like they're coachable or not coachable because it could be a great kid. But if they're a great kid and they're just running all around the defensive zone, that's gonna translate to our level where you know we try to play free too, but we, we try to play within some structure because we feel like we need that to compete against the most elite teams in the country. So knowing what you're supposed to be doing out there as Jane was alluding to is really important for us. You know, knowing that you're able to execute on a game plan that your coach put together. Thanks. Um, I know, like, especially for D1, like, your hockey skills can help you get, in, like, get into the school academically. But, like, I, I just want to know, like, in D3, if, that, if any of that is, like, the same. That if you're... Like, yeah, if, like, your hockey can, um, your skills can help you get into So if you're, like, if we project to be, like, a future All-American at Division three level, can that help you? within like the admissions academic, process? Yeah, like, like maybe like yeah. more towards like next half and um, getting into those schools. Yeah, it's a good question. I, I, I mean, I'll be quick, but I think it's different everywhere. Uh, like I said, you know, we, we could absolutely love a kid and we may get some flexibility on the admissions end, but we're not gonna get a lot of flexibility on the financial end. And that's just us, right? Like that, but there are other schools that operate differently and uh, you know I'm not sure I don't know I don't think you asked that question in the process but just know that every place is a, a little bit different when it comes to that but certainly you know we create a list and we advocate for kids and if we think a kid is going to be a difference maker if you want to call it that you know we'll go as high up as like the vice president of enrollment and say like this is a kid who can really take us to another level and see if there's anything that they can do but I don't know, I, I think the thing I would say is like, don't bank on that, right? Like the old, what I was saying up there, like don't bank on like, I'm really good. Someone's gonna, you know, either dip their academic standards or give me more money than I qualify for to get me there. It could happen, but I wouldn't go into it with that mindset. To, to add, yeah, so um, I had friends, I. So I had friends, I had one friend who was really good going to Wisconsin, like couldn't get into the school at Wisconsin and coaches never got her in, she went somewhere else. Like, that's a big school. You'd think maybe she, she's a really good hockey player, maybe she's going to Wisconsin, like you'd think she would be able, they'd be able to help her get in. Like, didn't work. I mean, at Colgate, it's really hard to get in too. I had to take my ACTs, I don't know how many times, because my coach was like, oh, we, we need to really, talk to um, admissions to get so-and-so in and we think you could do better on your ACTs. And I was like, thanks coach, yeah. Like, I'll sit through four hours of the ACT again for you. Like, that's how it is. Like, you, you don't, it's like not up to you. It's like up to your coach and mercy. Like, if you wanna go there, like, you gotta do what you gotta do. But we had girls, yeah, that had to be interviewed by the dean of students, and, like, in order to get into the school. Um, it's, I wouldn't bank on it. Like, like you said, yeah, it might work out. Even at the Division One level, it might not work out. Like, 
That's why your GPA matters, and then maybe a little wiggle room on how you do on your standardized tests. So, as high as you can, as, as, as well as you can do academically in school, and then on those tests, like, do as well as you can. Um, from coach, from what I've heard from coaches is if they advise, like, if you're eligible to play two sports in college, um, that most coaches like that because it means you're like always active. But for the recruiting process, like if you wanted to play two sports, you would have to talk to both coaches. Would you say that you're interested in playing two sports or act like you don't even just keep the two sports separate from the coaches? Or like how would you put that into? It's a Nazareth experience. Uh, you should definitely tell them. Like this is your experience. If, if you if you say that, and either of those coaches says, I don't know if we want you playing field hockey. It might not be a good fit for you if you want to do both. So I would say definitely say that. Definitely make that clear. It could help you in the process if two two coaches are advocating for you. Uh, but definitely, definitely bring that up. No need to hide it. Uh, again, I think the more information you share, the more information you'll get back. And information is power in terms of making your decision for the right fit. Yeah, especially at the Division One level too. It's it's more common at the Division Three level to play uh, two sports. At the Division One level, it's not as common, although it does happen. Um, but there are coaches, and I know, like at Colgate, like you, you couldn't have. Like we weren't allowed to play two sports. Like, especially like, oh, if you're getting a scholarship for hockey and then you're playing softball in the spring and you get hurt playing softball and your hockey coach is like, what the, are you kidding me? Like you have all this money from hockey and you get hurt in another sport, right? Like, come on. So if you go in and you're expecting and, and you, you tell the hockey coach, yeah, I'm coming. And then you tell the softball coach, oh yeah, I'll play softball too. And then you get there and they don't know that you're playing both sports and the hockey coach is like, no, you're not playing softball once you're there until like, that's a problem. So. Be transparent with them. If, if they're willing to work with you, they can do both, right? If not, maybe another school or pick, pick a sport. Yeah, also at the Division One level, it's tough because your scholarship <coughs> for one sport is going to carry over to the other sport. So you might be a hockey player getting a scholarship for hockey and then you choose to play softball. The softball team is going to get nicked for a scholarship as well. And they may not want to be caught with that with a, an extra scholarship. They, want, they might want to have that money for someone else. Um, and that, that can become difficult. But at the Division Three level, <clears throat> it's still, like, it's still a long, the hockey season is tough to play two sports. Mm -hmm. You can play, a, it's much easier to play a fall and spring than to play hockey and another one. Because even though that at the Division Three level schedules are tried, they try to set up schedules so there's minimal overlap, there's plenty of overlap. I mean, uh, so Division Three hockey schedule starts in mid October, October fifteenth. Like the second Monday in October, <coughs> and that goes till you make it to the NCAA's here in mid March. Yeah. So it's tough to be a fall sport athlete when your winter sport starts October fifteenth, and your fall sport's probably going into mid November. Yeah. Division One, you start September for hockey. There's your fall. When are NCAAs? April? End of March? Yeah, end of March. Start spring sports week. That would be a way to come back early from winter break. But yeah. No one is my father, Joe. Just <laughs> my work next month. Nichols is starting a football team next year. You should join Julia. Really <laughs> it was one year, all right? I had a lot of fun, too. All right, I got, uh, I've got two text uh, questions. One for Olivia. What happens if a class and a lift or practice are at the same time? Ah, class. Colgate class. Um, depending on the school, maybe you get away with going to practice or lift, but at Colgate it's a big time rule. Academics are first, and you cannot blame practice or lift for missing class. Your, our professors will go nuts and be calling the athletic director immediately, and you are in trouble. It's a, very bad situation um, but typically 
typically coach knows, um, or you have to talk to coach and say, um, hey, I have class at this time. Um, I, I'm not gonna be able to make it to practice. Well in advance, this should happen, like not the day of, hey coach, I have class at four and you're texting him at, I don't know, two o'clock to say you're gonna miss practice at four. Like probably the week before at least. Um, you might have outside activities for class. So like we sometimes at Colgate would have lectures at night or we had to go to this like orchestra thing for one of the classes, super random. Every, every freshman had to go to it at one point and you'd always miss practice or something. The coaches knew. Um, it's something where you work with your coaches on it. Like as long as they know in advance, you're not gonna be penalized, at least at Colgate um, for that. And you'll miss class for travel and games. That's a different story, but for the most part, you're working with your professors, you're working with coach, you have academic advisors, you have student athlete, um, academic advisors. They're all working together and trying to help you so that your schedule will line up and you're not missing too much class or practice. Coach Thompson probably can't practice. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you there are other schools that will be going to practice in that scenario. I wouldn't recommend it, but. Sophia. Um, if you like miss a lift, do you have to like make it up on your big time? Yeah, um, practices. So at Colgate, a lot of times we would have they're called specials or individuals. So if you miss practice, a lot of times you'd go on with just you or a couple other players and a coach and work on certain skills or do whatever you needed to do to make up maybe for that practice. Or a lot of times, and I loved it, you could just go on for an extra session. Maybe it was a half hour, maybe it was 45 minutes, maybe it was an hour, however long you wanted to stay out there. The coaches, you could tell them what you wanted to work on or they'd come up with some things um, so that you could um, improve your game. If you, like I said, maybe you don't have class one day, hey, coach, can we go on the ice? Um, so yeah, if you miss a lift, you're usually making it up. If you miss a practice, you're making it up at some point uh, or you're staying on after going on early some, something to practice. Okay, so this would be a this would be for all three of you. Are video clips and or YouTube channel helpful towards the recruiting process? Jamie, are they doing video clips and YouTube for your players? Yeah, so a lot of the feedback I get from, and from coaches is that not necessarily highlight videos. They, they like to see more of just a, an actual game film um, or longer stretches. They don't want to just see two strides, one stick handle and a shot, and then go to the next one, and then they see every goal you scored in the year, but they don't actually see you play hockey. So, um, although if you put it to good music, they, they usually appreciate that. So, um, but yes, video has become, at least on, I know on the boys' side, it's become huge because there are so many places to go. There are so many people to see. They can't get that real. So it's just way easier to be able to click on a video, figure out, is this person worth going to see live? And you know you can't tell everything from a video, but you can at least get a feel like, that person looks pretty good, I should probably go check them out. Um, so that, that helps a ton. I don't know what you would say, but typically, Uh, you can, I mean, you can. I mean, ultimately, like, we will ask for it if we don't, if a player comes from a distance and we've never maybe heard of where they're from. Uh, I, I mean, I would agree, like, highlight videos are okay. Um, but we, you know, we can't get out either. So if you're going up to Brampton in a couple of weeks, we're going to try to see if, at worst case scenario, if there's some live barn there that we can watch games and get a sense of the kid. Some of the leagues now in the tournaments will hire people to video the games, so we'll watch online. We do a lot of technology stuff. Like we have the Hockey TV account and uh, all this other stuff. But uh, to Jamie's point too, it is, it is just a, a way to get a sense of do you want to see a kid live? Right, you're not gonna make a decision over video necessarily, but it does tell you is this kid fit your profile enough to go out and watch spend the time on a Saturday or Sunday to go, go for a run. Um, so a couple questions for maybe some of our younger players. Um, what role, or actually uh, first one, at what age or, or level should we start to realize playing college hockey may be attainable or maybe D1 or D2? How old? <laughs> I'm 
discuss about? That is tough. I, I mean, I, I'm not going to answer that, but I will try to have, I'm going to do a thing and just think well, about it. I think about it because I, 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 I have a lot of experience on the boys' side, and I can tell you that they're kids like, I remember watching Noah Hannafin at 13 years old and knew the second I saw him, he was going to play in the NHL at 13. I also have watched plenty of kids at 19 years old that I never really thought were going to be very good um, or were pretty good. Well, one of them is right from Buffalo. I never in a million years would have thought Alex Iapalo would be a first line NHL player. And there he is. Even at 19 years old, he's good. He was a good college hockey player. And he turned out to be a first line NHL player. So, I mean, it, when is it obtainable? I, I don't know. I think, <laughs> I think that you, for the younger group that's here, I think that, and this sounds really philosophical, I think that you need to, to love what you do. You need to find joy in playing the game and just focus on being a great teammate and working hard every day. Because if you start to think about, is my talent going to get me to college? You don't know where you're going to be for, you know, at 14, 15 years old with your love of the game still. You might not want to be a college hockey player at that point. You might have another sport, another passion. Um, so I, I think if you're 10, 11, 12, 13, if you love the game and find joy in getting better and working hard, then ultimately, yeah, I think that should become a goal of yours. And then I think you use the stuff around you, like just the concrete indicators of, you know, if you're playing double A, does it mean you can't? No. But if you're playing triple A and you're a successful player, and you're 14, 15 years old, there's probably a good chance that you could play somewhere. But in the end, I think, I don't know, I mean, again, it's philosophical, but so many kids, you know, the, and this isn't at Nazareth or just at Nazareth, it's everywhere, like, they think it's what they want to do forever. And then they get there, and they kind of forget that they just play because they love to play. And even though as coaches, we try to make it fun every day and make it an enjoyable culture, I don't know, I feel like they get themselves rooted in like, this is what I'm gonna do from age 12 on. And then they get to college and they're like, wow, there's a lot of work and I really like meeting all these other people and this is quite the commitment and so on. So, I don't know, I, I think that Love what you do, and then use the concrete indicators around you to determine if you know, college hockey can be in your future. Okay. Um, so it's 8.30, we're gonna have this for 90 minutes. I think unless there's some pressing questions, we might wrap up. Um, the one piece of advice that I got, I think was the best piece of advice I got from Lara when we were starting the process um, of, of another Bison parent, older than us, me, who had, whose daughter was recruited to play at college hockey at D1 level. Um, when we were looking at different schools, Ma probably remembers this, the piece of advice was, picture, if you get, if you hurt yourself, if you get hurt the first week or the first game that you get there freshman year, can you picture yourself being on that campus for a whole year with an injury and not being a hockey player, but being a student at that school? in terms of picking the right school, right? And making sure that the school is the right spot for you as a, as a, as a place to live, a place to grow up outside of just the sport that you're gonna play. So that was a great piece of advice. And that was the thing that I, that Lara and I talked about was if you, if you, if you wanna go to, to UVM and you blow your knee out in the first game, do you wanna be there for a whole year without playing any hockey? And that's the question that we, we use to make sure that that decision was the right decision. And I think it's something that you guys should think about too when you get to that point. So, and to go off that too, um, along with getting injured is the coaches. Don't just pick a school because you love the coaches. They change. They might tell you, oh, I'll be here forever. Yeah, okay. Like, that's what I thought too. Like, when I went to Colgate, we had two new assistant coaches when I was there. So, don't pick them just, just based on. Yeah, it's good to like the coach. I went to Texas school. You absolutely hate the coach, right? Like, it doesn't even make any sense. But just know, okay, they might change. Make sure you like the school, too. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, hockey is a small part 
of college. It might be what drives you through that experience. It might be what um, what keeps you engaged. But at the end of the day, it's such a small part. And if you hate the school, hockey's not going to be enough to make it better. And the reality is it's just going to affect your ability to play hockey at the end of the day. Because you're going to be unhappy in the other 20 hours of the day that you're not doing hockey. And that will seep in, and hockey will not be enough to make it better. The other last one that um, someone in the crowd just reminded me of in terms of if you're fortunate enough to have a couple choices, which not everybody's fortunate to have a couple school choices if they're going to go get recruited for hockey, um, don't pick the program or the team because of how they're doing that year and maybe they're having a great year and you just want to go play for the best team that's out there or the best team that you can get recruited on because they, they change significantly. Um, when Lara was going through the process with UVM, we did a, a research study and we went back five years uh, and looked at the top 10 schools five years previous uh, when um, Lara would be a freshman at the school. Half the top 10 were not, no longer in the top 10 uh, in those schools. So again, don't pick it because you think it's the best hockey program. Again, pick it because it's the right school for you. And, and then take a look at the hockey. So that's good advice. Is there any other questions? Anything else? I know we got a lot of other questions in the registration process. We'll probably do a um, we'll do a frequently asked question sheet that we'll send out because some of these were probably best answered in writing if they weren't answered by the folks in our panel. So um, I do want to thank uh, Chris and Olivia and Jamie and uh, especially Nicole School for hosting us. I hope this was of real value. We hope this was of real value and. Um, this will be the first of hopefully other things that we do to help everybody in the recruiting process. So thanks everyone, have a good night.